You can hear me okay? No, I did turn it on. Yeah, it's got the green light. And you still can't hear me? Okay, there we go. All right, well, thank you for um, being here today. And um, I always say I have to preach this Sunday, but really I get to preach. I, it, it's an honor, really, just to share um, something that God's given to me and to share with you. And so thank you, and thanks for bearing with me. Um, I decided to do something just a little bit different today. And so um, I'm going to preach through a whole book of the Bible. Or, yeah, so it's Psalms. So I hope you brought a snack, and we're going to be here a while. Just kidding, it's not. It's actually Jude, which is the, the last book of the Bible before Revelation. There's only one chapter and only 25 verses, so rest assured we will get out of here on time today. Um, and, and really, as I started reading Jude, um, there is numerous uh, sermons I could probably pre preach if I went down every road. And so what I like to do and what I want to do today is just to kind of give you an overview um, of what Jude says, because I, I feel like Jude is um, a book of, a, it's a warning coming to us. It's a book for us to um, come to action. Um, it's, a, um, it's a book that is very relevant for the church today, I believe, and so I hope you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed it. And Rick, uh, my brother-in-law, asked me, are you, are you going to do a fire and brimstone message? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. But I do feel like it, it needs to be right up to that point because it's a, it's a very serious um, warning that Jude is giving us today. And so um, I'm going to just go verse by verse. I've never done this before, so we're going to kind of see how this works. So um, you can turn to your Bibles to Jude, um, and that's the only place we'll be today. So Jude... One starts with Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So who is Jude? As you see here, it says that he is the brother of James. He is a servant of Jesus Christ. He is a slave to Jesus, but Jesus is also his half-brother. He doesn't say with his own authority of, I'm Jesus' brother, so listen to me. He comes to us with a humbleness of I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, I'm a slave to him. And so he wants to give us this warning out of his heart. None of uh, Jesus' brothers, there's four of them, and none of the brothers believed in Jesus and who he was until after he died and resurrected. And each of them have gone in their own way, and they have all become part of a Christian community, um, you know, being missionaries, and... Um, Jude beget, eventually became a Jewish Christian um, leader, and he um, was known for his missionary work and being a teacher. The second part of that verse says, to those who have been called, who are loved in God and Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love your, be yours in abundance. Um, and this was written to Jewish Christians. And so we can take that to heart, that, that he is talking to the church. He's not talking to unbelievers about this. He's talking to the church, who presumably know a lot about Jewish culture, knows their history, knows Old, time or Old Testament scriptures. Um, and so he is, mentions a lot of old scriptures from the Old Testament here. Also including, he references a book of Enoch. Now, Enoch is not in the Bible, but... They had a book that Enoch wrote that had some things very important that, um, that the Jewish community respected and um, read as part of their traditions. So starting in verse 3, it says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted by God's holy people. Now there's... Um, different versions when you look up what, what Jude is saying here, and he's, he's very urgently speaking. He had a message that he wanted to preach about the salvation, about the love they all shared, but the Holy Spirit came to him and said, no, I need you to give my people a warning. And he, he does it very er, eagerly. He does it, um, he's felt very necessary to, to write this message. Now, um, going on, it says, 
uh, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago has secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now, as we um, talk about this, do I believe that we have people in this church right now that have slipped in that are trying to um, disgrace our church or to deviate or be sneaky? I don't. I really don't here at Journey Church. But I want you to think of the church in whole, the whole entire body of Christ. But I do believe, um, and I think what struck me about this is there are other warnings that come with this. I think that there are things that have snuck into every church. Um, the enemy is coming in, and he is trying to destroy families. He's just trying to destroy relationships. He's trying to hurt our community. But we need to be on guard to not fall for those traps. We need to keep our eyes open so that we see the enemy coming. Jude tells us to protect the word of God. And this is what we're, we're supposed to be protecting is the integrity and the truth of the word of God. And Jude says to protect that like your own family. If someone came against your family, you would, do, you would have your eyes wide open and ready. And you would do everything you had to to keep truth and to protect your family. And so that is the charge that Jude is giving us today. God's word is the good news. And we need to make sure that the truth is carried on to generation to generation. And we do that by protecting it, as Jude tells us. Now, the ungodly men in uh, verse 4 that he's talking about here, these are pastors. These are ordained people, which is kind of surprising because, you know, you, you have pastors, um, ordained people's leadership that can come in because it's sneaky. It's the way that, that, that the enemy can get into your church because they're already there. There are people that you trust. And so they're the ones that he is talking about here. He specifically says they're the, in one of the versions, they're the ordained people. And Satan knows that he can't come at churches just uh, right up in a full frontal attack. At least that's the way that it's been. I think it's different today. But instead, he uses people to come inside the church. Because when we're attacked from the outside, what does our church do? We gather and we fight as a group of people. If anybody attacked any one of our congregational people or anything about our church, we would all stand together and fight back. But the enemy knows that's not going to happen, so he brings someone from the inside. He brings things from the inside, whether it's voices telling you you're not good enough, whether it's um, someone giving you bad advice, whether it's someone um, trying to undermine your teaching. He, he almost uses it, though, like a Trojan horse. He brings it in, and we don't even see it. And it says um, that God, uh, the people, the leadership at this time were basically saying, God's grace is so great. I can do anything I want because God's grace is so big that we can do sexual immorality and perversion because they said, they teach at this time that the bigger sin I'm doing, the worse I am, the bigger God is. So the more I do, the more God has mercy and the more God blesses me. And it shows all of you what a big God that we have, that he can have that much mercy even for a rotten person like me. That was some of the teaching that they were trying to bring into the culture. And in uh, Romans 5.20, Paul says this, God's law was given, and this is kind of where they're deriving this from. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Also, uh, in the New King James Version of the same verse, Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might be abound, but where sin abounds, grace abounded much more. So you can see how they've taken that and they've tried to pollute it into the more I sin and the more I live my life, it shows how much bigger God is. Does that make sense, Stephen? That, that God would say, you just do what you need to do. You sin, you go on because I've got so much grace. I love you that much. Now, I do believe that God's grace is sufficient and it is abounding. But we have a responsibility 
to not try to sin as much as we can. We have a responsibility to draw closer to God and become sinless, to become more like him. These men, again, were just saying, hey, as, uh, my bad lifestyle is only proving that God's grace and love, and I'm just a good example of how God's grace is which is completely ludicrous, but that was what the people at the time were teaching. They were coming into Jewish Christian churches and teaching that message. Judah wants to remind us, the people, of, of the consequences. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped to my verse here. Um, so in verse 5 through 7, it says, Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. In the angels who did not keep their position in authority, but abandoned their prior dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal life. And... This, to me, flows on to show that you think that you can just sin and God's grace just abounds over you, but there are consequences for your sin, for your action, for your unbelief. He starts out, when God brought Egypt, or brought Israelites up out of Egypt, he brought them out of slavery, and he was taking them to the land, a promised land of milk and honey. And as they got closer, they didn't go right up to the border, but as they got closer, they sent out spies to see what this land beheld, to see if they could have it, to see what it was like. And so the spies went over to uh, the promised land, and they went around and checked everything out, and they brought back, um, even brought back the fruit, like amazing fruit, and said, yes, it's flowing of milk and honey. And Caleb and Joshua were the only two out of the spies that said, yes, let's go. This is God's promised land. We can do it. It's amazing. But... All of the other spies went, yeah, this is really great, but they're really big. They're giants. They're going to kill our children. We cannot overcome them. They discouraged the people. They started getting this through all the people. And so then the people of Egypt once again started grumbling and complaining and saying, you know what? We should have died in the desert. We should have died in Egypt. At least we had things. And God was like, all right, that's it, I'm done. All right, I'm going to give you your wish. So that generation died in the desert. In 40 years, they, they wandered in the desert, and they died, and their children, who they thought were going to be killed, they are the ones that got to go into the promised land. The children um, was the first example. The, the children of Israel dying in the, in the desert were the first example of those who did not get God's blessings because of their unbelief. The second example that he talks about are angels who did not keep their position in heaven. Um, in the beginning, all angels were on God's side. They, they worshiped God. God was holy. But it says that a third of the angels went with the devil, and he and they set out on a mission to destroy God, to go against him. They, they joined Satan's army to rebel against God. They once were in the presence of glory, in the presence of God, and now they're in rebellion with Satan. And it says that, that these angels are in an everlasting change in the darkness until the great day of judgment. So another example of disobedience. Third example that he gives is the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah who gave themselves over to sexual immorality, fornication, and going against the flesh. Strange flesh are also examples of suffering vengeance from eternal fire. When the angels um, came into Sodom and Gomorrah, God had gotten word, uh, an outcry had happened that, that Sodom and Gomorrah was so evil that it reached God. And so God sends angels down and says, go down and see what this is about. Is this cry really true? So he sends two angels into the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. They get there. And Lot is there, and, and there's more to the story with Abraham and Lot, but you'll have to read that on your own. Um, hopefully this will spark interest in that. Lot says, you know, come stay with me, because they were going to stay out into the, the temple courts. But he's like, no, you better come and stay with me, because it's bad here. 
And they finally went with them, and they, they went behind the closed door of Lot's house, and all the men in the town came banging on the door and said, let us have these men we want to have sex with. And Lot did not allow that to happen. He, he said, first, well, here's my daughters. You can have my daughters, but don't take these men. They realized that the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah was as sinful and wicked as what had come to God. So those are three examples of that, that follow the teaching of, I can do what I want, I can be uh, mischievous, I can, I can um, sin, and God's grace abounds. Well, we just heard three examples, and, and jo, jo, uh, Jude reminded us these three examples of, you can't do that. These are things when you disobey, when you have unbelief. These are the things you can't do because God will destroy. And that's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God brought fire down on them and destroyed them. Verse 8 through 10 says, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing what the devil had said, the devil about uh, the body of Moses did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people will slander whatever they don't understand. And the very things that they do understand by instinct as irrational animals will destroy them. And these ungodly men who claim to know more, who claim to hear from God through their dreams, who claim to be the leaders of the church, who claim that they had secret information from God, that they were, the, you know, they knew more about God, and they were going to, and um, they would tell you how to live. These same men, they lived immoral lives, they defied authority, and they would heap abuse on celestial beings. In the ESV version, um, it says, in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheming the glorious one. Even fallen angels knew better than to blaspheme and rebel against uh, the God's angels. They attacked people, not the angels. And these men were so arrogant and so full of pride in what they thought they knew about God that even they would come against the angels. They rejected authority. They, they uh, lived in just defilement. And when the archangel, it talks about, was burying Moses, um, he, was, he was burying his body. The devil came, uh, Satan came, and tried to take Moses' body. And instead of saying, no, 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 you know, this is, you can't have this body, he's like, I, I'm not going to say anything. God will rebuke you. Because he knew that we don't fight our own battles, that our battles are fought by the Lord. He wasn't about to engage in with the enemy. We don't engage with the enemy. We engage with God, and God takes care of the enemy. Verse 11 says, Woe to them, these people. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Baal's, Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And again, I'm trying to just give you a, just a kind of a general topic overview of what Jude is about. And so how many people know about uh, Balaam's error and Korah's rebellion? Yeah, I, you did. Y'all, John did because you've been studying it here lately. I didn't know it either, and so that's kind of one of the pleas today. Pleas of today is to, to know your Bible and to start reading your Bible. So I'm going to give you this, just three quick examples of what those are. Um, Cain, most of you probably know, is is the brother of Abel, and he um, kills Abel out of jealousy, anger, and he has an, a, just an empty religion because Abel brought his first fruits to God that God asked him for. Cain decided not to give the best, but gave him some, and God cursed him for that, and he blessed Abel. So out of jealousy, and so God's saying, don't. Don't look at other people, what they're giving. You give what God asks you to give. You do your thing. and Don't, you know, stay, in, stay out of other people's lane. And so that was, that was the Cain. Don't be in the way of Cain. Don't be the jealous, envious type. And give God your best, your, your, your very best right off of the top. Uh, prophet into Balaam's error is in Numbers 22. So 
So Balaam was known as a very effective um, prophet at cursing and, and placing blessing. He was very effective at that. And um, so the, Mo the Moabite king, who was Balak, um, was in this land, and the, they saw all the Israelites come in, and they had seen what Israelites previously had done to their enemies, and they were, they were in great number. And so Balak gets scared, and he says, go talk to Balaam and ask him to curse the people of, Israelite, of Israel so that they don't overtake us and they don't take our things. So they went to Balaam, and he says, well, okay, let me see what God has to say about that. So he asked God, and God's like, you can't bless them. They're, you can't curse them. These are my blessed people. So Balak continues to uh, pursue Balaam, and he offers him money. He, he's very persistent. And so the Lord says, okay, go ahead and go with them and do and say exactly what I tell you. So Balaam goes with them, and he gets up to go and put a curse on the land, the people ahead of him. And everything that comes out of his mouth is blessing. And, of course, Balaam's like, hey, I've paid you. Why are you blessing the people? And he's like, all right, well, I, I'm doing what God tells me to do. And so then Balak comes, and that happens three times that Balak keeps bringing more money, more offering. And every time that Balaam stands up to curse the people, it comes out as blessings and the people are blessed. And Balak is getting scared here, and so he comes up with even more riches. And finally, Balaam says, I can't uh, curse these people, but I can tell you how you can curse them. Well, you can do that God will curse them. And again, you'll have to find out how that happened. But Balaam tells them, Balak carries that out, and, and 24,000 men died of the plague. So Balaam led someone deliberately into sin, which is our next example, you know, is not leading anyone into sin. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about different things that we do. Um, I should go down that road. Um, like, I mean, just for example, um, if you're drinking, you know, do you, is it wrong to drink? You know, that's between you and God. I'm not going to say it is or it isn't. But if you make someone stumble while you're drinking and you're, they're, they're trusting in you and you're drinking and getting drunk, that you're leading that person down the wrong path. You're showing them a bad example. So that is Balaam's error is that he led someone deliberately into sin. The rebellion of Korah, um, is another short story in Numbers. And Korah, who is a Levite, and 250 Israelite men started grumbling against Moses um, because Moses was in charge of the Israelites and not them. And so God had appointed Moses to be in charge just as God had appointed Korah and the Levites to be in charge of the tabernacle and stand before the community and... Um, minister to them. But here creeps in that ugly green giant of jealousy, and Korah was not satisfied with that. So he goes to challenge Moses. And so they came up with a plan and said, okay, we're going to do this, and whoever God chooses, he's the one that's now the new leader. And God came to Moses and said, get your people back from the tents of Korah and this surrounding group. And in the morning, God opened up the land, and he swallowed Korah and all 250 of his followers. We have, to be, we have to learn to be satisfied with the calling that God has on us because he's equipped us and gifted us individually in areas that he wants us to serve, in areas that we can benefit his kingdom, in areas that we will be effective. Chris is a great teacher. She is gifted at teaching. She's a studier, and she's very gifted at that. We have all benefited from her teaching. I am not a teacher. I just like to talk. So God has given me a voice, and I like to talk, so I just kind of tell you what I know. Um, you know, our worship team, who wouldn't love to sing like our worship team? I mean, oh my gosh, I would love that, but that's not my gifting. And if, and if Paul or Amy or um, John here, if they decided to um, do a different gifting, wouldn't we miss out on what God called them to do? 
So we each have a place in this body. And so we have to be willing to stay in our own lane and do the calling, unlike Korah, who wanted to be the boss. But God had already given them a very important task. So know, know where you fit and stay in that lane and do your very best for God. So back to verse 11, it says, Woe to them that have taken the way of Cain, or they have rushed for profit in Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's religion. These are all examples of what not to do. Things that Jude is warning the church against, which tells me, <coughs> excuse me that these things were happening in the church. And it may look a little differently in churches today, but I do think in some areas, these same things are still happening. I believe that Jude is very serious about this warning, how mistreating, misusing, and corrupting God's word can end in our destruction. Verse 12 says that the people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are, there are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn leaves without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. They are wild waves of the sin foaming up, their shame, wandering stars from home, black kiss darkness, I'm sorry, black darkness has been reserved for. I, I typed this out, and it's not quite making, I should have read it from there, because that I copied, so I apologize for that. Um, but this was saying that um, before the Lord's, before communion, they would have the Lord's Supper, and they would celebrate, and these same men, he's still talking about these same men that are leaders in our church, that are ordained men, they would uh, eat a meal <clears throat> that, that they were called the love fast, and it was designed to um, kind of prepare your heart for communion. It was a sacrificial time to fellowship and just prepare what was coming. Some churches, uh, some churches, the meal had turned into a time of gluttony and drunkenness. Some people would eat while other people were starving and hungry, is, is the part about the uh, love fest. And then during this time, living in the desert, they would see a cloud, and it was a promise. It was a promise of rain to come. And so he, he's mentioning that because these men had lots of promises. These men would promise great things, but they never produced. And, and the same with the fruit on the tree. Um, when you see a tree and you see buds coming out, you think of fruit. You think you're going to get a harvest. And it's the same, the same um, instance, the same kind of uh, correlation that the trees never produced any fruit. Just as these men, no matter what they said, the dreams that they dreamed and the, the, how big they thought they were and the secret uh, words that they got from God, none of it ever produced. And I think that those are the things we have to look at. Those are not only warnings, but he's saying at the same time, look at our fruit. If you have someone who is, you know, always in charge and always, you know, giving their advice and always telling people how to live and what God's telling them, if their life isn't producing any fruit, then you need to be aware of those people. Verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of of his holy ones to judge everyone and convict them all of all of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their godlessness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own desires, evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. And this is the book that I was talking about um, that he references is references uh, that isn't in the Bible, but um, the Bible says that, that Enoch lived 365 years and that he walked with God faithfully. And most of you probably know, remember the story that God just took him away. He didn't die. God just hooked him up. But Enoch was further reinforcing the judgment from God upon people who are ungodly, disobedient, and disdefiant. In verse 17, it says, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers. He will, they will follow their own ungodly desires. 
These are the people who divide you, who follow minor natural instincts and do not live by the Spirit. And it seems like if you think about today, you know, a lot of people you listen to, a lot of people you, um, <clears throat> a lot of pastors believe that we either are in or are very close to the end times. And if you watch the news today, you can kind of sort of feel there's definitely a shift in our, in our culture, in our society. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, and it certainly does feel like we are being ran by ungodly people who have taken God out of churches, who have taken God out of schools, who have taken God out of decision-making from uh, the White House on down to our local schools, the, the intervening that they're trying to do even in our schools. Um, and so it is time um, as a church that we really dig in that we learn the word of God, because I, I do believe that from now on, um, Satan really isn't sneaky anymore. He's not hiding anymore. He is full frontal attack on people, on God's word, on our churches. You think of um, churches that are now marrying same-sex people. You think of the abortion. You think of... Um, just the murdering that goes on and, and just the things in our churches that we aren't standing up for, that we aren't standing against. And I think that, that uh, you know, Satan is really taking advantage of this time. And I believe wholeheartedly that Sunday morning pew sitting to get your, to get your Jesus has got to come to an end. It's got to be so much more than Sunday morning. We have, as Christians, we have a responsibility to further the good news, not just to live it for ourselves. We have a responsibility to tell others and to be in our communities and our families telling them what truth is. Because if you're not a Christian and you're listening to all the things that are going on, you might not think it's, I guess it's okay, the government's telling me, or sometimes people that are Christians are telling me, but if you don't know that that's the truth, you're relying on someone else telling you. So we have got to really dig into our Bibles and know the truth so that we can stand up against that when the time comes. And, and I'm speaking directly to myself, too. Um, I, I need to do and be much better. Um, I don't believe that in coincidences, and I don't believe this is a message that God put on my heart just for y'all. I think he, you know, he is so faithful and he's funny because any time that I have a, like a conversation, a serious conversation, or I think about what I'm going to speak on, it's usually something dealing in my life. And so I'm not coming in against anybody. I'm speaking to myself, too, that we have to get proactive against drawing closer to God. We can't just be here on Sunday morning, and this is all we get, and then we go out. We've got to draw closer. We've got to draw closer. We've got to, we've got to be praying on our knees and even fasting for our churches, for our pastors, for our leadership, for our congregants, just our I-70 corridor, we have to get better at seeking God. And there is an urgency to make sure every day that you are right with God because you don't know when the next day is coming. I don't want anything coming between me and God. And so I, every day, you know, I ask God, or I try to every day. There are a few days that I miss. But I ask God to reveal to me things that I'm not seeing that are not pleasing to him. Um, in the Psalms, it tells us to ask God to uh, seek your heart, look at your heart, examine your heart, and see where things are not exactly lining up with the Word of God. And Pastor Dusty said last week that the heart is the most deceitful above all. Um, and I was having a conversation um, about sin with someone the other day, and um, talking about levels of sin, if there are levels of sin, and why... Um, and, you know, and if we're already saved, you know, why we try so hard? And I really believe 100% that it's not about if I can get away with it. It's not about if it affects other people. It's not about um, how good or how bad it is. It's, a, it's about a separation from me and God. And so we live the very best that we can. God gave us Jesus to, to be the example of Christ-like. Jesus was perfect. Are we going to ever be perfect? 
one day in heaven we will be perfect, but we have an example to live exactly as close and perfect as we can. That's our responsibility. That's how we love God. We show that we want to be completely nothing in between him and I or him and you. It would be like saying, um, if you were married and you just went, oh, I'm married, I got a ring, I know it, but I'm really not going to talk all that much to my husband, and I, I can kind of do whatever I want because I got that ring, right? It shows I'm married. That relationship wouldn't last. That relationship wouldn't be healthy, and it's the same thing with God. You've got that promise of salvation. But are you living every day, every moment of that? Are you, are you asking God, what can I do differently? Where can I change? We're always changing. We're always striving to get better. And um, it, it's funny, this week, um, I'm a speeder on the road. Just ask my husband. He, he, he looked up because he knows. I like to be in front. I like to be no other cars in front of me, and I, and I speed. And... Man, I'm like, why God this one? God convicted me of that this week. Like, it may seem like a small sin, but it's big to me because I like to speed. I like to get where I'm going. I don't mess around. And, and I don't like being in the left lane or the right. You know, I'm, I'm a left lane driver. But I'm speeding on pie, right? You know me, Chris, same as you. My friend Chris here. <laughs> but God has really convicted me of that um, because... Um, Rhonda asked me the other day, so if you're still speeding, are you going to heaven? Because I feel like for me, for, no, no, seriously, the, God talks to us, and I should have written the verses down, and I didn't, and I apologize, but we are subject to the authority over us, authority that he has put into place, which means I, my authority has said, you drive 75. Well, I like to drive 80 to 85, so I am going in rebellion. To me, it's rebellion because I'm saying No. I'm not going to do what God said. I'm going to speed. And, and I really do feel like that. I mean, I don't, I'm not convicting anybody. This is my conviction. Like, I, I mean, how bad it is. I put an address into Siri, and it's, you know, 310 miles away, and she says, you will arrive at 704. And I'm like, uh-uh. I'm going to be there by at least 650. And when we stop, you know, we're 10 minutes ahead. I'm feeling good. And the kids are like, I got to go potty. And I'm like, no, you're taking my 10 minutes. But the, and so for me, it's a big one. And I do feel like if, um, if, if I continue to go, eh, I'm just going to speed. I'm in rebellion. I mean, are we agreeing on that? I'm in rebellion. If I'm saying God has, I mean, God has convicted me. Maybe God hasn't convicted you yet, but he literally, the Holy Spirit told me, you stop speeding from the Holy Spirit. I can't not do that. That's like the Holy Spirit saying, don't, you know, don't get divorced. Don't, don't cheat on your husband. Don't, don't uh, lie. Don't steal. The Holy Spirit is telling me, and he is the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is telling me, slow down. And I, and I, and I honestly believe that, that he will protect me from an accident one day that I didn't get there too fast. I'm an early person, so I'm going to have to get up a little bit earlier. That's all it is. There's a sacrifice. And when God tells you to give up a sin, there's a sacrifice involved. So for me, it's going to have to be getting up a little bit earlier. I know you're all laughing and you think I'm crazy, but this has been a big thing for me. I, <laughs> I have been driving in the right lane with my cruise control on. That is like torture for me. But I'm going to do it. So if you see me down the street and I pass you, feel free to come back behind me, start honking and flashing your lights, and I'll be like... Yes. No, but I will get better gas mileage by not speeding. My dad was a firm believer in that. In fact, one day we were driving home from Texas, and, you know, dad, you know dad's like, no speeding and no jump rabbit starts off of the exit because, you know, we, we got to keep the speed limit to get better gas mileage. And we were, we were in Burlington, and I called my husband, and I'm like, well, I'm in Burlington. I'm, we'll get home soon. And he's like, slap a 20 on the dash and floor it. So... <laughs> Not speeding is a struggle for me, but when has any time God had you give up a, a sin not been a struggle? I mean, really think about that. Any time God tells you to change courses, to do something, to not do something, it's a struggle because our flesh wants us to do that. So in verse 20 to 23, it says, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and by praying in the Holy Spirit, see, he tells us this is your warning. 
Now he's going to tell us what to do to overcome that. Your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothes stained, stained clothing that is corrupted by the flesh. We need to be increasing our faith and growing our faith. Keeping yourselves in God's love by obeying him and trusting him. Not the three examples that we saw of unbelieving and misleading people into sin. Not those things. Don't be like the Israelites grumbling and complaining and not trusting God to do what he says. And don't fall out of God's blessings like the Israelites did. Paul, if you want to come on up. So just a a list of seven things that I kind of gleaned from that. Build yourselves up in Christ. Just like you build yourselves up physically to get your body better and in great health, do the same thing spiritually. Build yourself up. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Spirit when you pray. Keep yourselves in God's love. Repent and ask forgiveness and ask God daily to search your heart because we become a little bit immune to our own sin. We don't always see it. It's not easy sometimes when you're in it to see it. So ask God to search your heart. Keep looking for Jesus' return. If you live every day like Jesus is coming back tomorrow, would it look like the same thing you're living today? Like if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, would you feel different? Would you act different? And if your answer is to yes to that, then, then think about that. Practice mercy towards doubters and unbelievers. And, um, you know, I've, I talk to a lot of women through nails mostly, but, um, you know, they get offended by people and they're like, you know, they told me this or they did this. And I said, are they a Christian? Well, no. Then they don't know better. I mean, sure, you know better not to steal and lie and all that, but to hurt people and to say awful, ugly things, they don't know any better. They don't have the love of Christ in them. So, so show mercy. Don't get so offended. And... Give them a break until they know. That's your opportunity to know that they're maybe they're not a Christian, so, so share your faith with them. Practice, oh, I did that. Practice mercy. Share your faith because faith comes by hearing. You know, someone's not going to probably get to know, that per- same person's not going to get to know God by going, now the Bible says this, look, read. No, they're going to they're gonna come to know Christ by you saying, you know what? I know you didn't mean to hurt me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, forgive you for that because I know you didn't mean to. You don't know the love of God like I do. Let me tell you how God is love. His love is unconditional. It's forgiving. So they're going to, they're going to, faith will come by hearing and hate all sin. Hate all sin. You know, I, I pray all the time, you know, God, prick my heart like it pricks yours when I do something. You know, let me feel your tear. You're weeping at my sin. Let me feel it on my own cheek that I know that I'm sinning. To him who is, in verse 24 and 25, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We will be presented to the Lord just like that faultless, in front of our God. If there is, an, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you, if there is an issue, um, like me with speeding, if, if there's something that God puts on your heart, even if you don't think it's a sin, maybe it's going to lead to it. Maybe it's, if you're going down a bad path and God's trying to give you heed warnings to you, please listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't get mad because he's telling you to change something. Even if it is, I'm like, why now? Like, I've spent my whole life. Why now, God, when I'm enjoying it and I got places to go and people to see? But he did. I mean, he flat out, the Holy Spirit, slow down. So please listen. Um, We're going to have the altar open. Um, If if God is convicting you of something or if you just need prayer, our prayer partners would please come forward. Um, If you just need prayer, come forward and, and talk to these people. Um, yeah, if you two want to come up, or are you leaving? You're leaving. Okay, so Rhonda, can you come up?
And Debbie, would you come pray with Rhonda? So if you if you feel God, the Holy Spirit, you know, talking to you, you can come talk to these amazing people. They will pray with you. And you know what's said, what is said in your prayer is stays in your prayer. It's nothing anybody ever repeats. But don't ignore that because I believe, honestly, I do, and I don't know where it comes from. I don't know when, but I believe there's going to come a time in the near future. Um, and, and the best example I can think of is Peter. When, when Jesus is getting crucified, or before Jesus is crucified, Peter's all about Jesus. I never will leave you. I'll never, I, I'm your man. And Jesus is hung on that cross and being crucified. And then where's Peter? He's not there. I, well, I, I didn't really know him. No, I, I know of him. I didn't really know him. And I believe there's going to come a time when we're in that situation. It may not be as drastic as that, but we can see that they're crucifying God all over again. They're trying to bring down what he stands for. Are you going to be willing when someone says, Billy, are you a Christian? Do you believe in God? Because if you do, you might get hurt. Are you going to be, a, can you say, yes, I believe? Are you strong enough? Are you studied up enough? Is your faith enough to stand and say, I do believe? Because I, I, I do honestly believe that time is coming when we're going to be asked to get off. You know, you're either for God or you're against him. There's not going to be this middle anymore. You're either for him or against him. So get that, get your heart prepared for that. Get your heart right today and make sure that God is evaluating your heart. Ask him to and then act on what he says. Listen to him. And how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God how great, how great is our God, and how great is our God, and sing with me how great is our God. So much, God, that you give us warnings before disaster hits. God, you give us examples of how not to live. Thank you for that. God, I pray that, that every one of us individually will seek you at a deeper level, that we will be on our knees, God, just praying and asking the Holy Spirit to tell us, to show us the things in our lives that are not pleasing to you. God, I pray for willing hearts to accept what you say, to act upon on it, Father. God, I just pray that we as a church will just know your word better, Lord, that we will be able to be uh, or have wisdom, Lord, when people come to us and want to know things, when, 
when things start really going crazy in this world, God, people will be looking for an answer. People will be looking for help and refuge, Father. Let us be those people with wisdom and knowledge and mercy. God, give us mercy for people who don't know you yet. And give us anticipation, God, that we, whoever we come in contact with, God, that we have an opportunity to share our faith with them. They would come to know you and love you, Father. God, we just ask that you would bless this day. God, just give us someone to talk to about you, Father. Give us boldness to speak your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.